Welcome everybody once again to this the Latino Book and Family Festival. Today we have a, a lot of things happening. First of all, we're going to go into a little bit of financials uh, related conversation with Adriana Berner. She's with My Point Credit Union. Then we're going to get into an indigenous representation, a storytelling tradition that's with Kathleen uh, Chicot, like uh, with Native Talk storytellers. And later we're going to get a conversation with uh, Congressman Mike Levin. Finally, we're going to end with Ballet Folklorico, that's with Jose Jaimes, that's going to be joining us here today. And at the end, we're going to give a couple ruffles of, of a gift basket and a, um, a gift card from a cafecito. All right, so let's get uh, started. First of all, um, we're going to have a presentation with Adriana Berner. She's with my business. It did, She's the business development manager at my point credit union, helping individuals, families, and local businesses and everybody in between do more of the things they love. And so the organization has helped members basically for over 70 years. Uh, now their website, mypointcu.com. All right, let me go ahead and get into the presentation for that. Buenos días, good morning. I'm Adriana Brunner, Business Development Manager for My Point Credit Union, formerly Point Loma Credit Union. So happy to be here at the closing ceremony of the Family and Latin Book Festival. Um, a passionate uh, and lover of Latin American literature myself um, from Colombia. And for a very long time, since I was actually in high school, I was reading some of the greatest Latino authors like Gabriel García Márquez, Octavio Paz, Carlos Fuentes, Pablo Neruda, Gabriela Mistral. So I'm so happy that there is an organization that is supporting these authors that are coming into the field of literature and also for our families to enjoy the beauty of uh, bilingual and Latin American literature. So that's really, really fantastic. I wanna show you a little bit about what strategies you can use for your children and families to save for the future. The Great Union is a non-for-profit financial institution. So part of our goal is to educate the different families, educate you about what is important to save for the future and what type of financial decisions you should be making for your kids, your spouse and your family in general. Establishing a savings fund or an emergency fund is something that every family needs to do. And we will highly recommend that it's between five to 10% of your income. So it, it sounds like a lot and I understand. So what I mean is just try to put aside what you possibly can every month to start to establish that fund. On the other hand for kids, it's important to teach them about the difference between wants and needs. With my daughter, for example, uh, do you want a video game or do you need it? So of course they will say that that's something that they really need, but it's not a need, it's a want. Needs are things that we need to survive. We need to pay our electricity, our mortgage, our auto loans. The rest, as I say, is just kind of decoration. Not that you have to stop living life, but it is important for them to see the difference. It is important for them to learn the value of work and what it takes to earn that money. So you can use chores and other things at your home where they can understand that working means earning an income. Having a piggy bank is a great idea. Once you have your piggy bank, make sure you explain to your child that you will divide it in four parts. The first part are the bills that need to be paid, right? As I mentioned, your regular utilities. The second part is savings. What are you saving for? What is your goal for savings? Are you going to buy a car in the future? You want to save for college? What are you saving for? The third part that is really interesting is investment. And I always give the example of a lemonade stand. That's actually a product investment. You need lemons, ice, water, and cups, and you are actually selling a final product that becomes your investment. So there are some entrepreneurs out there, I'm sure. And the fourth part is charity. 
as uh, Latinos, we need to make sure we are giving back to our community. That's actually really, really important. So make sure once you have that piggy bank, you choose them, that there are four main items and they need to recognize that. At the credit union, we have different products and services. I invite you to visit us at mypointcu.com. I will quickly share with you our website. It's really interesting because you actually can take a look there with our podcast. We have articles. Here is our learning part. And if you click here with our partner, Green Path Financial, it will take you actually to a website where you can learn about budgeting, financial literacy for families, how to buy your first car, and many, many more things. So that's all for me. I want you to enjoy the rest of the festival. If you need to reach out to me, my email address is a, as Adriana, Brunner with two N's, A-B-R-U-N-N-E-R, at mypointcu.com. And it's a privilege to be here. Felicidades por este festival tan maravilloso y que disfruten. Hasta luego. Uh, thank you, Adriana, for uh, sharing all that information with us. And um, before we go into our next session, I just want to uh, mention to everybody that today during the live programming, we are going to have a two, two raffles, actually. One is El Cafecito gift card, which we didn't raffle last time at the end of the meeting. So today is going to be the day. Uh, and my Point Credit Union gift basket. So that's courtesy of my Point Credit Union. And you can visit them at mypointcu.com. El Cafecito is located in Vista, California. Therefore, um, we all have to be local in order to receive that one. But all right, let's get started with our next presenter today. Our next presentation is about indigenous representation and storytelling tradition. Our presenter, Kathleen Chikalt Wallach, with Native Talk Storytellers. She is a storyteller, writer, and bilingual elementary school teacher. Through her Native Talk storytelling presentations, she teaches Native California history and promotes cultural awareness in schools and other venues. Her book, The Gift Basket, and its curriculum guide are used by teachers in San Diego classrooms. Kathleen is involved in teacher education, curriculum development, and finding alternatives to the fourth grade mission project, nativetalk.org. All right, welcome Kathleen, welcome to this session. Um, please uh, go ahead and, um, you know, I, I mentioned a few things, but you're gonna probably clarify what is all this about storytelling? What is this tradition that you have uh, going on? It comes back from your ancestors, most likely. Yes, yes. First of all, Miu Yam. Hello, everyone. And just one little thing is actually my last name is Wallace with an E. Somehow the E was. So oh. my name is Kathleen Chilcote Wallace, which is fine, but just so you can find me later. And my website is um, nativetalk.org. Um, so I am Luiseño. We call ourselves also Atahum, uh, which means the people, or Payom Kawichum, which means people of the West. And I am an enrolled member in the San Luis Rey Band of Mission Indians. Um, our ancestral area is uh, the Oceanside, uh, Oceanside San Luis Rey Valley is where my ancestors had their village. However, the Luceño people, ter the territory of the, of the greater Luceño uh, group runs from about uh, Carlsbad, Encinitas, all the way north to San Juan Capistrano, and then east to the Palomar Mountain and the foothills there. I would also like to acknowledge that there are four uh, native groups which are indigenous to San Diego County. And those are the Kumeyaay, the Luceño, uh, the Cupeño and the Cahuilla people. And so San Diego County has a very, very rich indigenous culture. And although often when I speak, um, when I do presentations, we, we speak about uh, life in the past, long ago. But one thing that I really want people to understand is we are still here. We are still here. We are 
Um, living in modern times, I often tell my students, I watch Netflix and I enjoy going to In-N-Out for a burger, but I still tell the old stories. We sing our old songs. Um, we still practice basket weaving. We still make our, our um, traditional houses called kicha. We do many, many things to preserve our culture and our traditions. And um, many of us are very involved in language revitalization as well, because there was a time long ago when we were not allowed to speak our language. And so um, it's very, it's very um, wonderful that today um, those efforts are, are blossoming and more and more people are becoming uh, uh, conversant in, in their native languages. Now, storytelling is a really important part of Native culture. Our stories um, carry our history down through generations. Our stories teach us how we need to take care of the earth. Our stories teach us how we need to behave with each other. Our stories teach us about the plants, when to gather, um, how to care for the plants, and long ago, um, even when boys and girls misbehaved, they were not scolded or punished, but they were told a story so they would know how to behave the next time. And in fact, that's how I grew up. Right now, even, I am sitting in a little house uh, near the beach in Oceanside that was my grandmother's. This is where I spent a great deal of my, um, my childhood. And I was never scolded if I did something I shouldn't do, but I was always had to come into this very room where I am right now, the living room, and I would listen to a story. And that's how I would learn my lesson of how, how I needed to behave. So I come from a family of storytellers. I spent a great deal of time with my dear, dear grandmother, who, who was Luceno, my uncle Andrew, uh, Uncle Andy, who told wonderful, wonderful stories of the animal people. Now, it is said that long before man walked on earth, the animals lived here and they could talk. And so many of our earliest stories featured the animals as, as the characters. Now, today, we still continue telling those old stories and, and retelling them. And we also continue to create new stories. And in the little in, in the introduction there, um, this this book, The Gift Basket, is a story that I wrote based on traditional themes. The animal people appear in it, humans appear in it, and it's really based on um, a lot of information about plants and how we we take care of the earth. Because when we go out and gather, we never take more than is needed. We always thank the plants for allowing us to gather, and we always leave something for someone the next day. Now, the story I would like to share with you today is a very, very old story, and it's been told on this land in San Diego County and particularly in North County for hundreds and hundreds of years. And this is my own retelling of this wonderful story, and it's called The Man Who Traveled West. Now it begins with these words. Kalgush kuna, yamaik yamaik. Now yamaik yamaik means long, long ago. Kalgush kuna means I wasn't there. I didn't see it with my own two eyes, but this is what I'm told happened. So the man who traveled west. Kalgush kuna, yamaik yamaik. It was long ago in those early, early days when the first people lived upon this land. And once there was a young Luceno man who was a very good hunter and fisherman. He never took more than he needed, but he always provided plenty of food for his family and his people. Now on one fine day, he decided that he would go out into the ocean to fish. The ocean provided us with many, many resources. So he took his Thule Reed canoe down to the beach he pushed it out into the waves, pushed it past the waves, and then climbed in and paddled out into the deep water. When he was out deep enough, 
He took out his fishing line, which was made of cordage. Cordage is just another word for rope or string. And tied to that fishing line of cordage were six fish hooks made from the abalone shell. He dropped his fishing line over the side of the canoe and he waited. Before long, he caught three fish. He pulled his fishing line up. He took the three fish off the hooks, put them into the Thule Reed canoe for safekeeping, and he needed two more fish before he returned to the village. So he dropped the fishing line over once again and waited for two more fish to bite. Well, while the man was waiting, the cool breeze that had been blowing over the water suddenly became a fierce, strong wind. A storm blew in and began to push the man in his canoe across the water, covering many miles. It was pushing him far, far to the west over many hours. All the man could do was hold on to the sides of his Thule Reed canoe. Eventually, the storm died down and the man could see land in the distance in front of him. He paddled to shore, pulled his boat up onto the beach, and he stood there and looked around. And he realized he was in a place he had never been before. People came out to greet him and they were strangers. The man had never seen these people before, but he could understand bits of their language and they were very friendly. And he understood that they were inviting him to stay and to live in their village. And he did so happily for quite some time. Oh, the man helped to uh, hunt and fish. He built and repaired houses. He made tools and bows and arrows. He did many, many things to contribute to the life of the village. He learned to speak the language of his new friends. But as you can imagine, eventually, he became lonely for his own people and his own village. And so he decided to take the risk of going back across the water once again. His new friends agreed that this was a good idea. And so they helped him build a nice, sturdy canoe. The night before he was to leave on his journey, his new friends held a big feast. Oh, there was wonderful food and singing and dancing. And they held this feast to thank the, friend, the man for all that he contributed to the village. And at the end of the feast, his new friends gave him two gifts. One was a large shell that was filled with food that would replenish itself. It would fill up again whenever it was empty. And the second gift was a small bag that he was told he must never ever open under any circumstances, no matter what, he could not open that bag. The man thanked his friends for the gifts. He put them inside his kicha, his house that night. And the next day when he was ready to start out on his journey, he safely put the gifts into his, his canoe. He said goodbye to his friends and he set off across the water. He was very lucky. The sun was shining in the sky. The ocean current was just right. The wind was just a nice warm breeze, not too strong. And the man was able to safely cross the water once again. This time, when he pulled his, him, his boat up onto the beach and looked around, he knew where he was. He was on the beach near his homeland. He looked up on the bluff on the hill above the beach and he could see the women from his village gathering seeds and nuts and berries in their gathering baskets. Their willow bark skirts were blowing in the breeze. People came, came out to greet him. And this time he recognized the people. They were his brothers and his uncles and his cousins. The man was so grateful to be home once again 
that he gave that shell that was filled with food that would replenish itself whenever it was empty to a village elder, to a grandmother in the village so that she would always have plenty of food to eat. He took that bag that he was never to open under any circumstances and he put it inside his kicha, inside his house for safekeeping. Now, every day as the man came and went from his kicha, he saw that bag that he was never to open under any circumstances and he wondered what was inside it. And each day his curiosity grew and grew. One day, he almost opened the bag, but he stopped himself just in time. And he took that bag that he was never to open under any circumstances, and he put it at the far back of his house, at the far back of the kicha, and he covered it with deer skins and rabbit skins because he thought that he, he could no longer see that bag. He would no longer think about it and his curiosity would stop bothering him. Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. Still, the man continued to think about what might be in that bag that he was never to open under any circumstances. And finally, he could not stand it any longer. He went straight inside his kicha, he threw off the rabbit skins, he threw off the deer skins, and he grabbed that bag that he was never to open under any circumstances. He stepped outside of the kicha and he stood there. He stood there holding the bag and he was holding it so tightly that his hands began to shake. Finally, he could no longer control himself. He opened the bag. And as soon as he did so, hundreds and thousands of fleas came flying out of the bag, covering the man and covering the ground around him. And it is said, my friends, that that is how fleas came to be on our land. Hamutap, the end. Noshun Lovik, thank you very much. Wow, that, that was a very uh, interesting story. Never heard of it before, <laughs> like many others, the ones that you, you might have. But, you know, it's, it's very interesting, the fact that as you were growing up, like your parents, your grandparents were already teaching you these stories and as a learning lesson. And so that's something that, in, at least in my on my side, that never really happened. The stories to, to learn, to teach you. Uh, it was more stories of what had ha what has happened before, but. but. But those are also important stories. Those are our family stories, which yes. I, I, have, I have many of those as well. Um, and those are important to pass down, to pass down in, as well. And, you know, I've, my, my mother, my dear mother is 91 years old. And she talks a lot about her early days here in Oceanside. And I've told her, I gave her a, a, a notebook and I said, you must write these down. We want to hear about um, the man down the street who had rabbits that traded rabbit meat with grandma when she baked him pies with the fruit from her trees in the backyard here. Or, um, you know, the how she used to go and work in the tomato fields and things like that. Um, so these, and we all, we all have stories. We all have family stories. And these are all um, stories that we can, we can tell our children, we can write down. Um, children can save them, they can read them and children can, can write their own stories as well. And so, um, and if, if any of your, anyone in the audience is, is, interested in more particularly Native American stories on my website, I have a, a quite an extensive reading list of Native American stories and other information and just go to the website and click on resources and it will take you right to the to the book list. That will and be nativetech.org. That is correct. That is correct. And so um, I say to all of you, um, Noshun uh, Lovik, which means thank you very much. And I, um, 
Uh, I wish you happy storytelling and, and happy reading. Well, thank you for being here. We are very happy that you were able to tell us your stories and, and a little bit, a lot of things to learn. Yes, there's always a lot to learn and, and books are the best place to start. Yes. <laughs> it was a beautiful story. Thank you so much, Kathleen. I really, really enjoyed it. Uh, and I hope uh, many people call you as a result of you presenting here uh, with us. And quite appropriately, I believe the 1st of November was um, the Native Indigenous Heritage Month, if I'm correct. Yes. So it was so appropriate to have you here. Yes, yes. Well, thank you. It's just been a pleasure to meet everyone today. And um, I'm, I'm happy to share stories anytime. All right. Anytime Thanks at all. <laughs> okay, thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye. Notion Lovic. Yes. All right. Uh, to continue uh, today, the conversation, we have a Congress leader, and in Congress leader interview, this is with Congressman Mike Levin. The interview is presented by Kirk Whistler. Let me go ahead and introduce them here. Congressman Mike Levin represents California's 49th congressional district, which includes North County San Diego and South Orange County. Currently serving his second term in the House of Representatives, Levin sits on the House Committee on Natural Resources, the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis, and the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, where he serves as Vice Chair of the Committee and Chair of the Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity. Levin was raised in South Orange County. He went on to study at Stanford University and later attended Duke University School of Law. Prior to being elected to Congress in 2018, Levin fought for climate action while working as an environmental attorney. He also served on the board of the Center for Sustainable Energy and co-founded Sustained OC, helping accelerate the transition toward more sustainable power generation and transportation alternatives. Throughout his career, Levin has been a passionate leader on environmental protection, clean energy, and combating climate change. Interviewing him is Kirk Whistler. He is the board president of Empowering Latino Futures, which is the organization that puts together this, this event. And also um, the publisher with WPR Books, Western Publication Research. All right, let's get started. Well, we are honored to be here today with Congressman Mike Levin, uh, who's been representing North San Diego County for, for a while, and we hope a lot longer. And uh, first of all, I wanted to spend just a minute and give you a little bit of background on uh, empowering Latino futures. We were founded in 1997 by Edward James Olmos and myself because we saw there was voids within community programs serving the Latino community. Our very first program was the uh, Latino Book and Family Festivals that we've now held 69 of them around the United States combined attendance of over 90,000. We started the next year, the International Latino Book Awards, and we've now honored 3,470 authors in 105 categories. And uh, we also do the National Latino and American Indian Scholarship Directory that has just under a uh, billion dollars in resources and has been used by 182,000 students across the US. Um, my background, I uh, was the founding president of the National Association of Hispanic Publications, newspapers and magazines back in 1982. And so we work closely with Latino newspapers and magazines from across the US in everything that we do. Uh, and then also just serving North County with our education begins in the home. We've distributed over 160,000 books to underserved kids. And that, uh, and that 
was started by Edward Becerra when he found that uh, a lot of low-income households had no, not a single book in the house. And, and so it motivated him to, to get out there and work on that. But uh, we're honored to, to be working with you on, on all of these. Well, honored to be working with you too, Kirk. And uh, I wanna congratulate you on that impressive uh, history and, and all you're doing for the community. That's a really remarkable work that you're doing. Thank you, thank you. What is your vision for North San Diego County? Well, thank you uh, again for having me. And, and perhaps uh, I think it'd be important to know a bit about my background because it's important as it informs uh, my vision as a representative and, and what I hope to accomplish. You probably would not know from my last name or from looking at me, but uh, my mom is Mexican American. And uh, my mom's parents came from Mexico when they were very young. My, my grandmother was about four or five years old. My grandfather was 12 years old. And they, uh, they came uh, from my, my grandpa from Culiacan, my grandmother from Durango. Uh, they went to Texas, uh, through Texas. Uh, my grandma and her family lived in El Paso for a number of years, eventually made their way through Arizona and then uh, to Los Angeles where my grandpa uh, and grandma got married and they wound up having five girls, including my mom. Uh, and uh, they started a successful small business, my grandma and grandpa and, and my uh, grandfather's two brothers called Bringus Brothers Jukebox Company or Bringus Brothers Music Company uh, back when the Wurlitzer was a thing and people were still using jukeboxes all over. And, and my grandpa was very lucky uh, that uh, he was able to become a distributor for Wurlitzer in the Western United States. And uh, he believed very strongly that if you worked really hard in the United States, that there'd be a better future for him and for his family and for his, uh, eventually his grandkids. And I think he would be really honored that his youngest grandson, that's me, uh, became a uh, member of the House of Representatives. So I'm a proud member of the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, uh, having one parent who's Mexican American, the other who is not. My dad is Jewish and uh, his uh, family is from Eastern Europe. Uh, but isn't that the beauty of America where you, you have somebody uh, with that diversity of background uh, where uh, you know working hard and, and doing well uh, really was the vision and the dream that my grandfather believed in. Uh, and that uh, you know ultimately uh, led to him becoming an American citizen at age 50. Uh, mm -hmm. And for him, it was you know the proudest day of his life. I, I know that. Uh, very well. Uh, I think that my hope in Congress is that we can keep that kind of dream alive, uh, that America can continue to represent that beacon, beacon of opportunity and hopefulness and a better life for immigrants. And I think we have to remember that immigration strengthens us when we consider the participation and uh, the, uh, the, the country that we have today uh, and the contributions of, of immigrants of every type uh, but I'm particularly proud of uh, the contributions of the uh, Hispanic and Latino community and Mexican American community. Uh, and I know that that's felt all throughout San Diego County. And for me, making sure we have immigration policies that are respectful, obviously, of safety, but also treat people with humanity and dignity, treat people as human beings. Uh, that's so critically important to me. My background also is as an environmental attorney. So I worked as uh, a, uh, a clean energy advocate and, and worked on a lot of renewable energy projects and things of that nature. And when I got to Congress, I knew that I wanted to try to make an impact on the climate crisis. Uh, my wife and I, we have two young children, nine and seven years old, and I want for them to have a, uh, a planet that they can live in and thrive in. And that certainly includes uh, our beautiful communities, our coastal communities, where for us, and you know this, uh, climate change is not theoretical for us anymore. We see it, we live it, we experience it, whether it's the year round wildfires or uh, the smoke that's caused from them or uh, the droughts or, or uh, the coastal erosion and bluff collapses, you name it, we are seeing it in San Diego, particularly along the coasts of San Diego. And my district, as you may know, goes all the way up to Dana Point and all the way down to UCSD. And we have to make sure that we protect our beaches, protect our coastline, and do all we can to reduce our greenhouse gas footprint. So in terms of my vision for North County, it's trying to represent the values 
uh, of our communities, trying to do all I can to help the average person uh, to get by and, and to improve the quality of their life. Uh, and again, to uphold the, the dignity uh, of everyone in our community. And I know there's so much more that brings us together uh, than separates it. So I, I hope that collectively we can turn down the temperature a little bit uh, and remember what brings us all together. Well, thank you very much, Congressman. And I know while others in Congress care about global warming and climate change, very few had the detailed background that you had prior to going into Congress. So that's a real asset. Plus, I want to commend you for your involvement with the Congressional Hispanic Caucus, because that is certainly a key issue here in, uh, in North County. Well, thank you, Kirk. And it's a very exciting time right now with the president's Build Back Better agenda. We are moving ever closer to getting it across the finish line. Uh, and uh, I'll be off to Glasgow, Scotland for the uh, COP26 climate conference with a congressional delegation next week. And my sincere hope is that we will have passed both the bipartisan infrastructure framework and the Build Back Better Act in the House so that when we go to the international community next week and we uh, try to lead on issues of climate, we try to lead by example. And uh, when we're there, you know, if we have these bills uh, passed in the House, I think that'll be a huge uh, wind at our back as we go uh, to, uh, to try to convince the international community that we can protect the environment and grow the economy at the same time uh, while treating people with equality and decency uh, as uh, we believe as Americans. That's what makes us America is, is treating people with respect and dignity. Excellent. What motivated you to switch from a legal career to a career of public service? Well, I think in the wake of the 2016 election, uh, really thinking about the type of future that my children uh, would have in the United States, uh, we uh, ultimately uh, need to protect this planet. So thinking a lot about the climate policies of the last administration, the environmental policies of the last administration uh, versus what I think we need, which is to uh, figure out how we're going to reduce our emissions, whether it be from the movement of people or the movement of goods, the way we build buildings, the way we generate electricity, the way we grow food. Uh, we have to think it all through and dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas footprint, uh, along with emissions of things like methane and other short-lived uh, climate pollutants. So thinking about the future my kids are going to someday and their kids are going to someday inherit. Uh, and then thinking about the strength of our democracy and our democratic institutions uh, knowing uh, that, uh, in my mind, the last president uh, did need a check uh, on uh, how uh, he was uh, operating. And I think that we did that after the 2018 election. Now, of course, it's working very hard with the new administration on this Build Back Better agenda, uh, trying to do all we can on climate, all we can on health care and child care, and also getting uh, the hard infrastructure, the roads, bridges, water, broadband, all of that. Uh, across the finish line as well, helping get our economy back on track to full employment. It's been a very, very tough 18 months with COVID. We've all lived and experienced a, a very difficult period, really unprecedented in modern American history uh, with a public health crisis and an, an economic crisis directly related uh, to the pandemic, the likes of which we have not seen uh, in our lifetimes. And we have to be prepared uh, for the bumpy ride that that has created in terms of our economic recovery. Uh, but I think that the policies that we're putting forth right now will get us on track to full employment. Uh, I do think that uh, my hope uh, by uh, the end of next year, we'll, we'll be back to where we were in terms of the employment situation. Uh, and uh, also uh, that uh, some of the, the near term uh, things we're seeing like inflation and, and supply chain uh, issues, that those will be transitory in nature and that we'll get back on track and, and uh, have a much better 2022. What are some of the federal programs specifically benefiting North County Latinos? Oh my goodness. Well, I think if you look at the Build Back Better Act itself, uh, that uh, you can break it down into three buckets. So climate, healthcare, childcare. Uh, so for climate, there's $555 billion in the legislation 
and it impacts everybody, not just the Latino community. But if you're interested in putting solar on your roof or buying an electric vehicle for your next vehicle, um, or if you have a business and you're thinking about alternative power uh, generation, uh, it will dramatically, dramatically improve the economics uh, of those decisions. Uh, for example, for electric vehicles, a $12,500 rebate uh, for your next vehicle purchase, uh, just as, as one example. When it comes to our ch uh, child care and our children, the Build Back Better Act says that if you make under $300,000 a year, that child care will not cost any more than 7% of your income, which is a huge, huge deal. We know a lot of people want to go back into the workforce, but child care has been a significant uh, hurdle in that regard. Also, the further extension of the child tax credit, you might know as part of the American Rescue Plan, parents have been receiving a monthly check. Those checks will continue uh, for another year. And then I'm really excited about this, Kirk. For the first time in American history, we will have universal preschool for three and four-year-olds because of the Build Back Better Act. We know that when we invest in children, that there are long-term dividends uh, up to a seven to one is what I've seen from independent economic analysis that when you invest in a, a child, when you invest in early childhood education, when you make sure they have enough to eat, that's the other thing. I have my Stop Child Hunger Act, uh, a version of which was included in the Build Back Better Act, which provides a summer EBT card, a summer debit card, uh, so that when children uh, are not in school, that their parents can get some supplemental funding to help their children have enough to eat. Uh, during those summer months and during the breaks. So that's uh, everything with regard to children. Then with regard to healthcare, major provisions to expand upon uh, the Affordable Care Act to make sure that uh, the Affordable Care Act uh, premiums are as inexpensive as possible uh, for everybody that wants to sign up. And I would highly encourage anybody watching this, if they don't have health insurance or they're interested in Covered California, which is our state exchange, go to Covered CA. Uh, dot com, and you might be able to get health insurance for basically for no monthly uh, premium. And, uh, you know, I highly encourage that. So all of the above in the Build Back Better Act, and then in the bipartisan infrastructure bill, again, our roads, our bridges, our water infrastructure, our broadband, we saw during the pandemic, just how many students did not have high speed internet, very tough to work from home or study from home if you don't have high speed internet. And the bipartisan infrastructure bill goes a long way towards filling the gap for people that do not have high speed internet. And then water is so critically important in Southern California. When we built our metropolis, we did not have a permanent supply of drinking water. And what the Build Back Better Act and the bipartisan infrastructure bill do is they invest very heavily in water recycling and water desalination. Two things that I believe in very strongly that we've led on in North County, uh, but these bills, this funding will go a long way to help us redouble our efforts on water supply, resiliency, uh, and diversity. Excellent, excellent. Why do you feel COVID vaccine rates overall and specifically for Latinos are dramatically lower in North San Diego County than in South San Diego uh, cities and elsewhere? Well, it's, it's definitely been a disappointment to me, Kirk, because it's very, very simple. The vaccines work and they're free and they're available just about everywhere. So if even one person who is watching this has not been vaccinated, please get vaccinated. They are safe, they are effective, and they are the best way that we could keep COVID at bay. Uh, a lot of people talk about freedom. I like freedom from COVID. That's what I want, freedom from COVID. And the easiest way to do that is if we get vaccinated. Now, in terms of the discrepancy between North County uh, and uh, South County, uh, I can tell you that it isn't for a lack of effort from our friends, whether it be uh, the community clinics, uh, like uh, Vista Community Clinic or True Care, uh, they are working overtime and they are trying very, very hard. But I do think to an extent, it's because of the decentralized nature of North County. Uh, you've got a lot of different jurisdictions, different cities and so forth. Uh, but I can guarantee you that that piece in the UT definitely opened a lot of eyes and they're going to redouble their efforts at the county uh, and, uh, you know, do everything they can to get everybody vaccinated as quickly as they can. Excellent. Excellent. 
once we get past COVID, past the 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 bills being the current bills in in the House and Senate, uh, all that gets resolved. What would be your key goals related to the Latino community going forward? Well, look, we need comprehensive immigration reform, uh, long overdue. You know, we're talking about immigration in the context of this bill on the basis of what we can get done with a simple majority in the Senate. Uh, because the way that this, these bills are moving in the Senate, particularly this Build Back Better Act, uh, is using a process called reconciliation that requires only 50 of the senators to agree. And uh, the benefit is that, uh, you know, it's very difficult to get 10 Republicans to agree to a lot of things. Uh, but with regard to, to, to immigration, it limits what we can do because it's only, reconciliation is only designed, I don't want to go too far into the weeds, but I'll just say, it's only designed for things that are directly related to taxation and revenue. Mm -hmm. And that's where we've run into some challenges trying to get immigration related policies uh, into the Build Back Better Act. But we're not giving up by any stretch of the imagination. I know that uh, my Senate colleagues, many of my House colleagues working very, very hard, the CHC working very, very hard on that. Uh, and look, I would like to see something more akin to uh, what we did with the Dream and Promise Act, making sure we take care, take care of our agricultural community uh, and our, our dreamers, our TPS our recipients, all, all of the folks that are working hard uh, that are contributing positively to our society, to our economy. I was very honored that the, the first year that I got to bring a guest uh, to the State of the Union address, I brought a dreamer uh, from uh, UC San Diego. She was a, a senior at the time at UC San Diego. And I know from our community that our dreamers, they, are the, they, they have the same aspirations that I, I mentioned at the beginning of my own grandparents, mm -hmm. where they're here, they're, they're young, they're working hard, they want a better life. And in many cases, they know of no other country really because they came here so young. Uh, my mom likes to call her parents, my grandparents, the dreamers of their day. And so I hope in Congress, we do right by the dreamers of today. Excellent. Well, we look forward to, to those steps happening. And we also appreciate your support for local candidates like Cibriano Vargas that are, are sort of, it, in the ground uh, every day out there serving those local communities and that. Uh, well, thank you very much for, for having me. It's been a great discussion. Yeah, and, and once things go back to normal and we have our uh, Latino book and family festivals in person, we will certainly be sending out an invite to you. Thank you so much, Kirk. Great to be with you. Thank you very, very much. All right, so thank you for staying here to this presentation. Now, let's get started with our, our following presentation after um, we have here related to Vallejo Clorico. Allow me to- Our next presentation relates to Vallejo Clorico Performing Arts. Tierra Caliente Academy was founded in October 2004 as a nonprofit organization with the mission of using the cultural arts for outreach and development in our community. It was founded by director and instructor Jose Jaimes, whose prior experience with nonprofits and the arts in only five years has helped brand Tierra Caliente Academy into one of the strongest academy in the county. The arc of folk dance, baile folclorico, danza folclorica, is not a hobby. It's a discipline that not only transforms your body, but the cultural and historical component teaches you values opens your eyes to the beauty of diversity and broadens the knowledge of your own identity. Their mission and vision aligns with discipline and respect. If we respect and value our own culture, we will do the same with the valuing, the respecting of other cultures. And if we are disciplined in rehearsal and the stage, that discipline transfers to all academics and our community work, cultivating education through the arts academytc.org. All right, there you go. Thank you, Jose, for um, joining us here today with um, for the Latino Book and Family Festival. 
Um, I see that probably I had an updated, outdated <laughs> draft. It's not been five years, is it? <laughs> Well, no, that's, I think that was from last year. So it's been, it's now we're in our seventh year. Wow. I, so it, time goes by really fast. So, so, you know, but it is what it is, I guess. <laughs> you have a lot of materials in the back. That's all yeah. the dressing might, and all of that, huh? <laughs> I'm actually here at the studio and it may, you might hear in the background the, that they're actually rehearsing. So you hear people, you know, stamping and then some music. And this is the office where we store everything that has to do with the show, you know, like the accessories, the costumes, if you see there's more costumes over there, wow. there's more over here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, welcome. Well, thank you for, for um, you know, accepting the invitation to be here today. Thank you for inviting yep. me. Hello. We're delighted to have you here, Jose. You are a, one of the great leaders of North County. Well, coming from you, Edward, that's that's such a compliment because you know you do so much for our community that you know. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thanks. All right. So allow us uh, to hear from you. Uh, what is it that you do? Uh, uh, tell us uh, on your own words, basically your mission and and all of the effort. How does uh, a academy like Tierra Caliente? helps the students and the parents, because I know parents are the ones joining there too, not, not just the children. Yeah, definitely. I guess, uh, you know, to put that in a couple of words, I can talk about, uh, you know, how the academy started and then, you know, which obviously aligns with the mission. Um, so for that, I would have to kind of touch the subject of uh, Baile Folklorico or the folklorico component in our community the before, the now, and the after. Right. So before, uh, you know, when I was just a dancer, uh, you know, taking my first steps, uh, learning about the culture, the music, the, you know, the dancing, uh, it was more of a hobby. So everybody saw it in our community kind of like a hobby. Uh, you know, it was something that came and went, uh, you know, uh, you will see folklorico dancing here, you will see folklorico dancing over there, but that was just part of the entertainment or that was, you know, you know, something nice to look at, you know, especially little kids in costumes that, you know, that the cute factor kick, kicked in, you know, that like, even, even if the steps and the choreography was all over the place, it didn't matter because, you know, they look cute. Uh, so that was before. So Tierra Caliente Academy of Arts came in 2014 uh, with a proposal for the folklorico community, uh, basically saying, uh, you know, it's, it's nice that we have that cultural component in our, in our community, but we have to take another step. Uh, you know, dance, when you compare folklorico to, for example, a classical ballet, jazz, tap, you know, those, those dance uh, are categorized, categorized as a discipline. And then you have folklorico and it is a hobby, but actually, you know, if you go to actually the roots of, of folklorico, it is a discipline. Uh, and besides the discipline, you know, it tells the story of us as Mexicans. If you talk in folklore mexicano, it talks, you know, it's the history of us. So the history of us, those roots are not a hobby. You know, they have way more importance than that. So then in 2014, you know, we drafted all the models, the proposals and, you know, and and converted Tierra Caliente Academy into a five one city well, Fire One C3 nonprofit. And our mission is to go out in the community and teach the importance of the arts, maybe through dance, maybe through music, maybe through to song, uh, but basically uh, let the community share that and teach, teach that to the community as a discipline. Meaning that, uh, you know, we want their commitment. We want their support. We want them to look at the cultural arts as something that is part of us. Because uh, bottom line, the cultural arts are the heart of a community. So if you put you know, if you put that love or that passion into the heart of a community, and then the community thrives, right? More music, more dance, uh, more acceptance, you know, more unity. Uh, so that was 2014, you know. So obviously now seven years later, we're we're building onto the future of the rep representation of folklorico. Uh, and as an example, I'm gonna put one which is the Folklorico Dance Festival that we have every year. Um, 
we just celebrated our fourth festival back in July. When things started to open, we took the advantage, uh, you know, of that flexibility to, to be able to hold a festival. And we had the festival in July. Our next festival, which is going to be the fifth one, is in February at the California Centers for the Arts Escondido. And the, the idea for that festival is for it to be a platform where a lot of the directors, a lot of the instructors, a lot of the dancers, the dancers' families, basically the folklorical community to come together to one space, which is the California Center for the Arts Escondido, and celebrate our culture. You know, it's one day of performances and, you know, sharing our artistic proposals, learning more about each other, and even though we all have, you know, different ideas when it comes to what we put on stage or our artistic proposals, it does not matter because at the end of the day, we all represent the same thing, which is Mexico, right? Or the folkloric component or the cultural component of what Mexico is. So, you know, you take that before where it was used to be a more recreational. Uh, then, you know, you come, you come 2014 when things start, you know, to change. And now you come 2021 and you see a lot of groups being more organized, uh, you know, uh, so that impact is greater in the, in the community. And that's not to mention the impact that, it, that, it, that happens with the actual students. You know, where, they, where uh, you know, once folklorico is, uh, once folklorico is seen as a discipline, uh, then, then you have, for example, the, the students, the dancers, uh, be more proactive you know they're working harder they are setting and achieving goals uh, they're learning how to well how to work well with others uh, work together be creative think out of the box uh, you know be proactive be leaders uh, self-initiative uh, you know all that I mean and there's a whole bunch of more things that I can you know a long 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 list that uh, that folklorico, you know, gives as a discipline to the to the students. So, um, so when you see it as a community impact, then you have that right, that discipline and respect that goes onto the community and the representation of our cultural arts. And then individually, then you see that impact of those students who are, you know, who are growing uh, stronger, uh, you know, and more confident on themselves. So I, I guess that was kind of like, a, and a, I, I said it was going to be in a few words, but I, <laughs> I guess it was, it was more than that. But, you know, it kind of aligns with the mission of, you know, taking our cultural arts out there and sharing it with the community. Well, it requires a lot more words to explain that. So thank you for, for that uh, explanation. And I know you sent me a video. Would, like, would you like me to share it now? Sure. Let me give an intro to that video. Okay. Uh, so uh, we have our, you know, in the academy, we have uh, a lot of programs from, we start at seven years old. So at seven, even at seven years, seven to nine, you know, with that class, that program, seven to nine, we have the intermediate, sorry, we have beginners, intermediates, advanced. Uh, you know, when you come to teenagers, we have different levels. When you come to adults, we have different levels. And also we have our 35 plus uh, group group where we have a, a lot of grandmas practicing and, per se, and performing for uh, So our specifically our youth program, uh, we, we took a couple of the girls and we asked them, you know, what are the arts in your own words? You know, we didn't want to give them a script. We told them we want, we want to make a video and you would have to, you know, that's your homework. Think about what the arts mean to you. And then basically that's your script. Right, you you write your own script, and then we put together a video. So that only shows the impact that once, especially when you know preteens, teenage years, those are the toughest because you know uh, kids are still you know they're at that phase where they're finding themselves. So you know, uh, so if you are able to take those preteens and teenagers and make them fall in love with their culture. Uh, then it's like, you know, then you have them. Then you have a student who's striving to do better uh, through the arts. So, so that's kind of what the video is kind of about, you know, the, the cultural arts and diversity in their own words. So if you want to play it. All right. And after that, we're going to go into the question with Arthur. All right. Okay. Let's go ahead and check.
The power of the arts is that it provides us with a variety of tools that we use in our daily life. It teaches me how to be creative. Here in the academy, we learn two very important lessons, and they are discipline and respect. Our director teaches us that if we are disciplined in class, we will be disciplined in school and in our community. I not only respect and represent my own culture, but I also cherish and celebrate diversity. We are not only dancers, but we are a family. Discipline, respect, self-confidence, to be proactive, think out of the box, set and achieve goals, work well with others, work hard, work together. Did you know that Albert Einstein, the famous scientist, used to play the violin in his free time? Or that Condoleezza Rice was the first African-American woman to hold office as secretary in state? But she was also known as a renowned concert pianist. My hero is Harriet Tubman. I love her passion and leadership. Besides dance, I am very passionate about photography. I could be the next Annie Leibovitz of my generation. Besides dance, I love to run. I love the adrenaline feeling. I can be the next Maria Lorena Ramirez of my generation. Besides dance, I am passionate about makeup because you can show your creative side through bold colors. I can be the next Louis Castro of my generation. I am a dancer, but I also love acting, swimming, and baking. I am a dancer, but I also like to play soccer, do makeup, and learn about fashion. I am a dancer, but I am also in love with books. I am a dancer, but I also like to write short stories, going on hikes, and playing the guitar. In searching for identity and trying to understand diversity, our academy becomes a second home. In there, we embrace self-expression and provide a sense of belonging. The topic of diversity has always been a sensitive one, for no matter who we are, how we speak, or how we look, if we dig deep into our roots, we are more alike than different. Diversity is the unique qualities that make you different from another person. Diversity is the way you show you are born to stand out in accepting everyone for who they are. To that point, we need more cultural art programs, activities, and events in our community. Diversity is the unique features that belong to you. I am Tierra Caliente Academy. Thank you. I am Tierra Caliente Academy. Thank you. Wow, that was powerful, Jose. Uh, for a young, young uh, under 10, right? Children to talk about respect, dignity, diversity, education, books, sports. It is so powerful. You did a, a, a fantastic job. Thank you, Edward. Uh, during my classes, I mean, besides, you know, uh, teaching the actual component of dance or, or the music or all this, and that I do talk about, you know, the importance of being a leader in your community, about the importance of learning about yourself, myself, especially being very dark, you know, uh, being proud of your darkness, I guess, you know, being brown, uh, you know, and, and searching more about your, your culture. So I do try to plug the, those things in when I'm uh, with, in my classes, especially with the, with the kids, because there are kids nowadays are so smart. I mean, they are, compared to when I was a kid, I mean, they're just so smart. So, you know, so you got to make sure that, you know, you try to, to expose them to, to positive things like that, you know, challenge them uh, to think out of the box and think, you know, uh, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, let me go into uh, the chat a little bit and, and hear that, uh, well, read some of the, the comments. Genevieve uh, mentioned, thank you for having this great presentation. Uh, Arthur Hernandez, I believe he's, uh, well, he might be at the University of uh, UC Davis. So he's mentioned the hopes and struggles of all people are evident in this art, in its art and culture. 
And he asked a question, when can we expect you at the Mondavi Center at UC Davis? <laughs> oh, <laughs> well, let, let's let's talk first, definitely. Uh, I think uh, one of the the beauties of uh, the cultural arts is that, you know, we are doing it here in North County, you know, San Diego, but it, it you know, it, it's something that can definitely be shared anywhere. It's, it's awesome to go to a different place and be able to share the, the passion and the beauty of your arts with other people and vice versa, you know, learning about what they're doing over there and, and, learn, and learn from them. And then when we come back, you know, have a broader perspective of, you know, things that we can do. So definitely partnerships and, you know, going and supporting each other here and there are essential to the learning process of an artist. Yeah. So, uh, Edward, do you have any questions for Jose? Yeah, I, you know, uh, the your event uh, on Saturday, the Dia de los Muertos, was awesome. Uh, you had at least a dozen different groups there, right? Yes. So we, the event for us was from ten to four, and the, we actually had to push it to four thirty because the entertainment did not stop, group after group after group. And they were from all of San Diego County and Riverside County. Yep. So it was, if you kind of visualize it, it was uh, from Riverside coming here and then from Chula Vista coming here. So, you know, Southern California being here at the Dia de los Muertos. So it's a great partnership. You know, they are great groups. Uh, they have a very similar mentality of helping each other, you know, using that cultural platform to be able to work together because like I mentioned before, at the end of the day, we all represent the same thing. So it just makes more sense to be able to work together. And so what if somebody wants to join in, um, let's say no experience whatsoever, wants to try to get out of their comfort zone, but trying out something like this. I'm not saying it's me, but you know, just <laughs> it's bringing true. it up. <laughs> uh, then what, what, what's the process for that? Yeah, so that's why we have the beginner classes. Mm -hmm. uh, we at every age level, or age, you know, seven to nine, uh, ten to twelve, the twelve to fifteen, the sixteen plus, and the thirty-five plus. We have beginner uh, classes at, at, you know, at those at those age levels, uh, because it's hard uh, talking about folklorico, you know, in the past. Everybody was together. You had that dance dancer along with the beginner, so the beginner felt overwhelmed or you know felt like they didn't fit in so eventually you lost them so uh so with us you know they start at the same level as everybody else uh and we open the academy registrations twice a year so we are year round but we go by semester system so january to may uh to june sorry uh, january to june and then july to december so we go by semester system uh and Registrations are basically either at the beginning of the year or in, in the summer. So just uh, look into our, you know, if, if you have social media, look into, uh, you know, check it, check out our social media and you'll start seeing announcements why, once we have the open registrations. All right, sounds good. Um, I have in the, in the chat some uh, comments there and I see that, well, I'm not sure if, yeah, Arthur Hernandez, he mentioned he's a family nurse practitioner. And so Alma, she's from San Diego here. Genevieve mentioned, thank you, Jose. I'm so proud of you. The youth of today do not know our own culture, our own culture, I would say. Um, through your presentation, cannot only tell the history, but also through dance, visual art. Congratulations. There you go. And more information about the Academy Tierra Caliente, you can go to academytc.org. There you go. So and Jose, you are located in Vista, correct? Uh, yes, we have our, our studio in, in Vista. Oh, okay. On, on Santa Fe Avenue, right? Yes, 1011 South Santa Fe. Uh, yeah, and if you're driving on, on Santa Fe, it's a storefront, so you'll see the signs right away that says Tierra Caliente Academy. So yeah, come and check it out. Yeah, one other thing that I, I know that 
uh, you are not only the president of Tierra Caliente Academy of Arts, but you're also a board member of the uh, California Center of the Arts in Escondido, and you are the president of, tell us about this other organization that you are the president of. Yes, so thank you. Let me take that space to actually talk about the importance of partnerships. I mean, it sounds like, you know, Tierra Caliente is doing a lot of things on, it, on its own, but it's not necessarily, it does take a community, it does take partnerships to be able to make that broader impact uh, in the whole community. Uh, so I am on the board of trustees for the California Center for the Arts Escondido. Uh, and I'm also president for Folklore San Diego Alliance and very proud member of Route 78 Rotary Club. So I am, I am a Rotarian. Uh, you know, same as Edward. Uh, and then, you know, with the, Cali with the California Center for the Arts Escondido, you know, it's, it's the biggest uh, our, uh, arts institute that we have here in uh, North County, San Diego. So it's, it's awesome, you know, it's a, it's, it's a privilege to be able to be part of that board and be able to, you know, uh, along with all the other board members, uh, try to make decisions about how to best push the arts in our community. And obviously when it comes to me, I try to push, you know, the arts, uh, the cultural arts and, you know, cater to the Latino community, the underserved, underprivileged. Uh, so I am very fortunate to be able to do that from the inside at the California Center for the Arts Escondido. And they are great. It's a great board, it's a great institution. Uh, you know, I would, I would say, go into their website, you know, learn more about them because they make a huge impact uh, in our community. They made a huge impact on me. So, and now that's why I say it's a privilege to be able to be there myself. Uh, then Folklore San Diego Alliance is an organization only for folklorico dance directors. So it's specifically for, for them. So that's, that's where it comes to play that, you know, we are all working together to build that platform from which we can all work together. So, and for Close San Diego Alliance, we do have the directors from, you know, Riverside uh, all the way to, to Chula Vista. And that's why we, we kind of cater to Southern California. And a lot of our conversations have to do with how we can take the cultural arts, you know, folklorico representation uh, and make that impact on the families. May you be, you know, may your roots be Mexican or not. Right, because uh, we gotta learn about about you know teaching about who we are in our community is very very essential because then it touches the subject of diversity. And you know we are a very diverse San Diego County or Southern California. We are very diverse, so it's very important to learn about each other because you know we're more alike than different. So it's you know so we gotta we gotta celebrate those differences and obviously we got to cherish those similarities uh and then with rule 78 rotary club you know the the presenters of the mariachi festival which is which is coming up april 10th 2022 uh you know it's they've they've also been a great partner because they understand the importance of uh uh you know a rule 70 a, a rotary club supporting the community specifically the cultural arts you know they they see our, per, our performances they see our presentations uh they see our kids you know they know a lot of our kids uh so so it's awesome so how they you know they they go into the community and learn more about them uh in a grassroots approach you know being there because one thing is to be behind a desk and see the, see the videos, you know, see the photos and see it. But there's, it's, it's a very different thing uh, going out there in our community and being there, you know, with everybody, that grassroots approach where we learn more about each other and, the, and learn more about how to best help each other. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, so then that's Tierra Caliente Academy of Arts, California Center for the Arts Escondido. Folklore San Diego Alliance and Rule 78 Rotary Club sounds like a lot, but we all work in the same vision. I guess we all have a very similar vision. So, so it all kind of works together. It's like a puzzle that fits perfectly. All right. Very well said. One more question in the, in the chat uh, from Arthur Hernandez. And by the way, Arthur, if you can 
send us your email to the host and, and panelist. That way we can, um, Jose Jaimes can, probably you both can be in contact and hopefully one day he can all uh, go with his group over there and have a performance there. I'm not sure, I'm just not making promises here. <laughs> all right, so it, it, he mentions, I'm so glad to be on this Zoom presentation. Uh, can you tell us how you develop such a wide lens on how you approach the arts? Want to begin? Oh. Yeah. Oh, can you tell us how you develop such a wide lens on how your approach to the arts? Okay. So to start, you know, you have you need to have a passion for the arts. You know, so you gotta be very passionate about it. Um, it begins there, I guess. You know, it begins there. And then obviously you start to become more organized where, you know, you put your artistic models, you put your financial models, uh, you know, strategic plans and this and that, so that the impact can be greater and more organized uh, because passion can only, can only get you to a certain point. But if you want to make that impact in a broader way to a bigger community, then you do have to be organized. And that's one of the reasons that we, uh, we are a 501c3 profit that not only helps us, but pushes us to be more organized. Uh, but you know, if you go back to the root of it, definitely you have to be in love with your culture. You have to have a passion to share your culture with others. You have to have a passion to, you know, to be able to, to want to help others through the arts. Uh, and obviously you have to have you need to have knowledge about it because you know uh talking about the arts it's 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 beautiful you know showcasing the arts is beautiful but you also kind of not kind of you also have to know what you're doing in a way so you do have to have that knowledge about about specifically whatever you're teaching when it comes to the arts right yeah. uh, any other questions from from the attendees I'm gonna go ahead and allow you to become a, a panelist for those who are as attendees. You are, you don't wanna share your video, it's okay. Just wanna make sure that you all have any final chance to, to talk to the, the panelists here. All right, and so if nothing else, let me allow me to, to mention that we do have a, a raffle going on. <laughs> So to those who send up questions, you all became, well, questions or comments, you all are potential winners here. I'm gonna need at least your email to be able to contact you and send you this information. Well, the gifts basically. All right, and so I would say that our the gift basket can travel and the Cafecito gift card only here in Vista, California, you're located close by. Or if you plan to visit the offices of the Tierra Caliente Academy of Art, it's right next door, almost. Oh. <laughs> right? <laughs> there you go. Anybody interested in getting any prizes? Ask your final questions here. All right, thanks Arthur for sharing your email. I know one of the things that I really enjoyed at all of your performances, Jose, is that uh, you bring dances and music from all the different states in uh, Mexico. And, you know, it, uh, it's an exposure to the culture and the, uh, from each of the states. So when, when your dancers perform that, uh, to the uh, music of a certain state in Mexico, um, who came up with that concept of doing that? Because that's so fantastic. Yeah, so that was that's when we were putting together our artistic model. Um, you know, talking about the the old days in folklorico, you always saw Jalisco, for example. You always saw Veracruz. Uh, that's you know, that's all you saw. So when we decided to to in twenty fourteen to make that greater impact, specifically in this case, the artistic impact. Uh, we started to make uh, relationships, relationships, you know, uh, with uh, instructors from Mexico. Uh, so we, we, uh, a couple times a year, we do bring instructors from Mexico 
so that not only our instructors or, or myself, but our students can learn about, you know, there's so much, there's so many things to learn about Mexico when it comes to dance and music. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's enormous, you know, it's, it's, there's just so much. So, um, so we try to implement that in our programs where it's not only the popular regions, uh, you know, learn about, you know, all the way from Yucatan, you know, all the way to the south from Yucatan, Campeche, or, you know, the influence that we have close to us, which is like Chihuahua, or you go to the center of, of the Republic, like Guerrero, Oaxaca, uh, you know, even Mexico City has their, you know, their their dances. So, so trying to, I guess, it does make, it does take an investment. It does take time to, you know, to learn about all those different dances. Uh, but it's worth it because when we showcase them here in our community, uh, you know, I think uh, we make a greater impact because, for example, when we perform Campeche or Yucatan, people come to us and say, you know what, I'm from Campeche and I'm from Yucatan and it's been forever since I saw some of my dances performed here because I always see Jalisco, for example, right? Uh, so it's awesome, you know, to, to be able to bring that that representation of people who who are not over there anymore, who are here now and have not been able to see their dances or their music in the longest, longest time. So that that in itself is, is a very positive impact. Yes, it is. So if someone were uh, wanting to uh, help you as far as uh, monetary donation, because you are a 501c3, how would be, or how could they uh, donate uh, money to your organization? Yeah, there's two ways to go about it. The first one, you can visit our website and there's actually a given uh, tab and you can go to the given tab, learn a, li a little bit more about us. We actually have a video there that talks about, you know, uh, how you can give back. So we have a couple of videos on our website. That's, you know, that's the indirect way that you can maybe, you know, you can approach the Academy by, you know, doing a small donation. But, uh, but then the second one, which I personally think is the best one, uh, let's have a conversation. You know, let's me and you sit down so that I can, uh, so that you can learn about the Academy. I can also learn about you and we can learn about how we can best help each other. Uh, cause we ourselves, we try not to monetize from the, from the arts. I mean, meaning we do have to pay bills. So that's why our performances do have an admission cost, especially when it comes to the theater performances. Uh, but all the money goes back into the community either way. That's why we are a buy once a nonprofit. Uh, and we do that. We do need that support. So, uh, for all those sponsors or the partners that we have. Is because they they believe in the and in, in the arts and they want to make a difference in the arts. So that second option about me and and whoever's interested sitting down and talking about how we can best together uh, develop the representation of the arts in our community. Right. We have a question from Arthur. Um, yes. I have a question. Oh, Genevieve too. Yeah, Jose. Uh, can you give us a little more information about the family values? Because I do know that your wife and your children are part of this program. How many of your community dancers are family groups? Yes, we actually do have a lot of families. Uh, we, there's, I can think of three families where, where the mom dances in our 35 plus group. And then they have one or two or even three other kids in our different programs. So then it becomes a family activity. But more than that, it's kind of like a family bonding uh, where, you know, uh, if you take the component of, uh, of the arts, it teaches values. It teaches, you know, that bonding. Uh, and in my case, uh, with, especially with my daughters who, are, who have grown up in the, in the arts, I would like to think that uh, through the arts, I'm providing them the tools so that, you know, so that when they start making their own steps, they have a better chance at the world. Because, you know, now that they, nowadays, the world is a tough one. And as a parent, I will not be able to be, be there next to them the whole time. 
So the arts, uh, the arts, I believe, my personal belief is the arts gives them those tools to be better prepared. Uh, and then, you know, bottom line, if, if I'm, if I have a product, which is the arts and I'm not, and I don't have my family, you know, uh, taking advantage of that product, then there's a, there's a problem, right? So I, I myself have the, you know, the deepest belief in that the arts make a difference, not only in your kids, not only as a family, uh, but as a, but as a whole, um, I don't know if that answers your question, uh, Genevieve. And, and as a side note, thank you for always supporting. Uh, you know, you always, from the very, very beginning when I was, I was you know, my baby steps, I was crawling. Uh, you know, Tierra Caliente was in diapers. You were, you were there supporting, so thank you for that. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. And then I think, Arthur, do you have a question that you'd like to ask? Yes, my name's uh, Arturo, but you, I go by Art and Arthur as well. I, uh, I really like uh, what I'm hearing today, and I appreciate you guys very much. Um, the question I, I I'm I'm I've been a sponsor to a group, uh, not not all the time, but I do supply some money to a group in San San Pablo up here in the Bay Area, and it's called uh, I can't say their name exactly right. So Los Seno Senzontlis Los Senzontlis I think it's called. And um, they, they, it's a great, I'll put, the, I'll put their link in, in the website, but they're affiliated or Ron, Linda Ronstadt is affiliated with them. And for those who don't know Linda Ronstadt, it, she's a, a big time artist uh, who, ha, who hails from Latina uh, background heritage. And I was thinking, wouldn't, would uh, this group um, that, you're, that you have there, this, this organization, is it affiliated with some of the artists that are in SoCal or anywhere really that um, that would want to uh, work with you guys and bring more uh, uh, name recognition for one thing, but big, more importantly, re resources, whatever resources they might have. Yeah, um, well, uh, our affiliations are not necessarily with, uh, for example, such artists like uh, Lena Ronston. Uh, but I would like to think that uh, with the California Center for the Arts Escondido, we do bring a lot of very important uh, artists uh, there. And, and we do have the opportunities, either as myself being a director or even my dancers or the academy in general. And uh, something's performing with them, sometimes meeting them. So it's awesome for a uh, a kid or a teenager who's very passionate about the arts and you know and would like to eventually do something bigger with it it's awesome for them to to meet somebody who has who's a professional who's already there uh to give you one example uh actually one example uh next friday november 12th we at the california center for the arts escondido we are having ballet hispanico from new york so I have a lot of students who are going to go and again, they're going to see them perform. Uh, and then on March 10th, 2022, at the uh, same thing at the California Center for the Arts Escondido, we are bringing the Ballet Folklorico de Mexico. And, and same thing, uh, you know, um, uh, a lot of my students are going to go there. Uh, and last year I, have a, I had a couple of students meet the dancers in person, meet the director, uh, and, you know, so it's so maybe our affiliations are not necessarily that way where there's a specific artist who, who we're directly affiliated with. But being a board of trustees at the California Center for the Arts Escondido allows me to bring uh, those opportunities to to the academy. And and in the case, if you if you know about Folklorico, you know that Ballet Folklorico de Mexico is our biggest, you know, uh, representation of uh folklorico worldwide so just to have the opportunity to have them here and be able to you know be with them the whole day and talk to them and you know chat with the director and this and that i mean that in itself it's 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 awesome so i don't know if that answers your question arturo in a way arthur it, it definitely does and i think your your emphasis always seems to come back to generosity uh for the community and for that i am uh immensely uh thankful for your the what you're doing because you know it it really is amazing i i look for 
folks like yourself who are interested in more of the value of, of bringing together and, and the culture, the arts, and uplifting uh, voices and people that don't always get that. I really like what Edward was saying about from different parts of Mexico or different parts of the world, really, and not just one place over and over again, it's representation. And that that's really important. Um, as a nurse, um, what you said about having your family appreciate and enjoy the product. I think to myself as a healthcare provider, how important it is for me to see Latinas, uh, Latinos getting the healthcare they, that I help create for them, produce for them. So very well said. Oh yeah, definitely. And uh, as a side note, uh, I can I can add that I myself am a I'm a product of 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 uh, of, our, of, the, of this community of nonprofits because when I was uh, young, I was an at you know what what now is categorized as that at risk youth, and it took a lot of a lot of people, a lot of mentors to be able to teach me you know or at least guide me through the correct path. And, and this is my way of uh, giving back to my community because if it wasn't for those people, I, I have no idea. Honestly, I have no idea where I would be right now. Uh, and the arts is something that in a way, you know, to put a word on it, uh, saved me. So, you know, being a risk, I was introduced into sports and the arts. Eventually I fell in love more with the arts and, you know, and now fast forward to today, uh, it is my way to give him back. So, so even though my passion is the arts, I, I would like to think that I'm embracing that in a way that I'm also trying to make a difference in, in a lot of kids, especially kids, uh, youth, because I see them myself in them in a way. So a lot of those kids do need that guidance, do need those mentors, do need those role models. And, and if I can provide that through the arts, then, hey, you know, it's, it's a better community for it. How many different groups and how many total dancers do you have uh, in your organization, Jose? Okay, so right now, uh, dancers, we have about 120. Uh, you know, if you put together all the different programs that we have, uh, but we also are in the school system. So we do teach at a couple of elementary, uh, sorry, middle schools and high schools. Uh, so that's not counting the high schools and the, and the middle schools. But uh, here at the studio where I am right now, uh, it's about 120 members or 120 dancers that, that we have. Uh, so so it, it, it is exciting when we start thinking about our recitals because it's so awesome to see, you know, the progress of everybody. And uh, so and that impact because, you know, 120, it, is, it can be a lot. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad that we are growing and, and in that growth, uh, we are helping those, those dancers or those families in, in the process. Can you highlight the elementary schools that you're involved with? Yeah, uh, well right now we are with uh, Vista Magnet uh, Middle School. We are looking into Roosevelt uh, Middle Schools, uh, Middle School. Uh, we are at, at Rancho Buena Vista High School. We're at uh, Mission Vista High School. We have a partnership with uh, Mission Hills High School. Uh, and then, you know, uh, there's a couple, because we only have two instructors, uh, we were not able to go into many other schools, even though there was an interest from those schools for us to teach folklorico there. Uh, so we had to kind of like, you know, pick and choose. So we decided to go with the middle schools and high schools, simply because that's where we could do, have a greater impact. Uh, more on the discipline part uh, of, of, of dance. But, uh, but yeah, I mean, and, and in general, Vista Unified, I guess, uh, we, uh, we have a great uh, relationship with uh, Vista Unified. So, um, and I'm, I'm glad that they, they do appreciate uh, the arts, uh, and in our case, you know, folklorico. All right, so I'm very thankful that you were able to join us here. Uh, Jose Jaime, and just want to make a quick announcement. Arthur, you're the winner for the gift basket. We're going to be contacting you um, on that. And Genevieve, you're the winner for a cafecito gift card. So congratulations for that. Um, Thank you. All right. Uh, any final thoughts from anybody before we go ahead and, I mean, the discussion can continue, of course, but, you know, 
I don't want to take other people's time. And I, we have somebody who's going to go rehearsal too. That's Jose. <laughs> I just want to say uh, it's it's what what um, what Jaime said about the diapers part. And Genevieve was there when the organization was in diapers. And I'm thinking about the astronauts that are in space right now in diapers. And I thought to myself, there will be a time in the future that and I, I'm a nurse, I'm a bedside nurse, and I've changed a lot of diapers on a lot of people over the years, 20 years of this. I have to say, we all need help every, every so often, and what goes around comes around. And so, Genevieve, blessings to you for the work you did supporting this organization. And uh, those are silent heroes, in my opinion. So. Oh, yeah, definitely. Genevieve does a lot for her community in Oceanside, especially. especially. So thank you, Genevieve. Here, Anna, before I go, can I can I briefly uh, mention the, the next big event that we have with Tierra Caliente Academy? All right, yeah, go ahead. So uh, February 20th, and you know, it's it's a couple months away, so just uh, look for it in our social media once we start promoting it. But uh, February 20th, we have our fifth annual Tisitosa Folklorico Dance Festival at the California Center for the Arts Escondido. Uh, so it's a great way to come and celebrate with us the beauty of folklorico, the beauty of working together, you know, the beauty of being together as a community, and just basically a, a day of appreciating the, the, the arts. Uh, maybe that we're doing it ourselves, or maybe that we're sharing it with an audience. So, uh, so hopefully you guys, as the Latino Book and Family Festival, can, can have a presence there. Edward is going to be giving out books. You know, he usually is at, at, at our events. Uh, so, you know, just inviting the whoever's watching this or who's going to watch it later, you know, mark your calendar Sunday, February 20th, Visitosa Folklorico Dance Festival. Come and enjoy with us, you know, a day of Folklorico at the California Center for the Arts Escondido. Wow. Wonderful. I definitely have, I'm starting to fill in those, that calendar with events. Now that we can actually start going to events. <laughs> all right, thank you everyone. Thank you, Jose, for, for being here and, and providing all this wonderful information. Uh, Arthur, thank you for all your input here. And well, Edward, thank you for joining us as a moderator. This was um, the final live presentation from the Latino Book and Family Festivals. And this is a great way to conclude. We are still gonna uh, have some premieres going on with authors. However, oh, well, this is the last live programming. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Jose. Thank you, Edward. Thank you, Anna. Yes, and so here are the, the gifts for, for that we're gonna be giving out today. So we already announced the winners. Uh, thank you to all our partners and, and those who supported this programming. Thanks to your support, we were able to provide these great sessions. And we hope to seek providing this space, this setting to, to learn, to meet authors, to meet community leaders. And we'll hope that you can follow us on our Facebook page at the Latino Book and Family Festivals. Uh, more information about the sessions that happened previously, you can go to our website at lbff.us. All right. And thank you to uh, My Point Credit Union for sponsoring us for today's event or and Adriana Bruner for being on the video first, uh, first thing. Uh, so we hope to see you live next year at Miracosta College for our next Latino Book and Family Festival. That is right. Thanks to My Point Credit Union for that. All right, bye everyone. Have a nice weekend. Thank you and goodbye. Bye, thank you.